The, the house is called Janus, and the reason it's called Janus is because Janus is the Roman god of thresholds, entryways, doorways, portals. Um, Janus is usually depicted in Roman mythology as a god with two faces pointing in opposite directions. And so the space in between is, for me, is the notion of the space where knowledge is gained. So like you enter one side and you exit the entrance on the other side and in this little brief space here that only little tiny kids fit into, I, I know that because when they come in they immediately go in it, you've gained some kind of knowledge and then of course you exit, but you're not exiting because it's all an entrance. What you notice is, is that there is no back door, there's only a front door twice. So no matter which way you enter, you're entering. The real reason is, the, the why of that is, because I've, I've thought about this, is because regardless of how you enter into a new experience, you're still always entering into it. There's no way to enter the back door of an experience. And this piece is, this information isn't necessary for the viewer because you could just look at it. I try to pretend I'm the viewer and just say, well, that's cool looking. Mm -hmm. That was polka dots against that wall. But it's based on the 37 plays that William Shakespeare wrote. So if you look at it, you'll notice that there are 37 hexagons that make up this entire lattice-like structure. And the 37 are, of course, William Shakespeare's known plays. And each one of the polka dots represents a character or characters in the plays of William Shakespeare. And it's called drift because it's based on this thing called genetic drift, which the shorthand version of it is that if you isolate a population in a small location and they don't go in or out of that location over several generations, they will have intermarried to the point where every single citizen will have the same surname. Um, that's what's based on genetic drift. Of course, genetic drift can't happen with William Shakespeare because they're fictional characters. So they don't move in and out, but I like the idea that there's sort of this closed drift that's going on. And this piece is similar to the idea of the house. It's called Seesaw because it's a painting of a seesaw or a teeter-totter. Hmm. There's a big teeter-totter right here in the center. Mm -hmm. And seated on the teeter-totter at either end are two stick figures. So these are the legs of the stick figure going up a circle. And those colored portions are the thought bubbles, like a cartoon strip. And he's remembering what he saw when he used to be up. And then the guy on the top part of the seesaw is up here. And his head's at the very top there. And he's got his mouth open and a big O. And he's got his arms spread out like this. And he's basically seeing. And this was, at some point in my life, I realized the reason that we call a teeter-totter a seesaw is because at one point, somebody has saw, and then they go up and they see, and then they saw, and then they see. And I, it related to the idea of the house, the idea of like an entrance way into learning something. This was my observation of realizing that at some point, you, you don't have knowledge, you haven't seen the world, and then at a certain point you have, and then you take that knowledge with you and you've always had it. So even though you might not be in the presence of it anymore, you still have it. This is a series of books, the actual books that I painted on the surface of. It's uh, Vladimir Nabokov's book, Ada. Um, it's sort of his epic masterpiece. It's his longest novel and it takes place over about a hundred year period. And it's the story of uh, what seems as if two first cousins and their relationship, and then if you read deeper into it, you'll realize that they're not really first cousins, but maybe half brother and sister. And if you read deeper into it, you sort of realize that they're actually full brother and sister. And it's their lifelong relationship. Um, the most erotic, intense relationship that probably anybody's ever written about and it is about a brother and a sister. My interest in it was, in, in, 
regards to this show had to do with, again, with this idea of what's called thrift. Because they're a closed system, Ada and her brother Van, and I guess biologically we know that they could reproduce, but in fact they don't because Van is sterile. So it is a closed genetic system, so drift can't occur. And I realize that I love the novel and I love the way that Nabokov writes because he sort of writes in riddles. There's really very confusing aspects to what happens in the book. Van, the male character, is writing a book within the book about the structure of time. And it takes place for the most part in the 19th century into the beginnings of the 20th century. And in the novel, there are moments where Van and Ada, the female character, have appliances and products from a much later time period. And that's because, well, if you follow the, the sense of the novel, there's a possibility that Van, in fact, has cracked the nature of time. So it's possible that Van has brought products to the past, to the 19th century, that clearly don't exist. But that's, like, th those are sort of aspects of the novel that are sort of deeply interwoven into it. So that was my interest. The structure of them really has to do with this idea that at some point I was doodling the word Ada, A-D-A, because I love those, I love any word that you can take forwards and backwards. On the surface of the books I've written A-D-A, A-D-A, and then all the information that's already on the book. It says on all of his novels, Vladimir Nabokov, Ada, or Adore, fam a family chronicle. And so I've left all that information on them. And then these others, this one just is D-A, and the one over there is just A. This is another piece that is based on that idea of what the whole show is called Drift. And it's based on the mathematical uh, code, Fibonacci's code of numbers that sort of multiply themselves. And in this case, it's all based on cut hardboard tubes. So it starts at this far end. With one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four, fifty-five. And so it jumps according to Fibonacci's code, which is also reflected in nature. And that was my interest in it. And doing all of this really had to do with my idea that some, at some point in the universe there was this sort of perfect shape, um, and then the Big Bang happened. And ever since the Big Bang, this is my thought process, ever since the Big Bang, we've been trying to get back to that perfect moment, that single shape. And this is called a letter always reaches its destination. And that title came about because of when I did research, when I was actually searching for companies that made cardboard tubes because I wanted a wide variety of them. Um, it began with finding at a garage sale about five crates of the cardboard tubes that make up the last piece. And I bought them for relatively little money. And then I started looking on the internet to where, how I could get other sized tubes, how much they would cost. And I started learning that cardboard tubes are used for what we think of as like to mail something. But also the thicker bodied, heavier ones are used to roll caskets into the incinerator during a cremation. And that interested me a lot, this <laughs> idea that, so calling it a letter always reaches its destination has a lot of different reasons for it, but I liked this idea that you can mail something, but also you can sort of send something off to its final destination, um, along with these cardboard tubes. Mm -hmm. This is called flaneur, and it is a it is linen tape um, used for hinging drawings, um, and inset into the linen tape in certain uh, places are again small cuts from atlases, and the notion is, is that it, it does the same thing that drift does. It's, it's this, this migration, kind of a geographic migration across a, a matrix or a lattice. And it takes on any shape that it will take on once it's placed on the wall. 